Hello, my name is Zabilan Tolman. I'm a physician and chief editor at AMBOSS. I'd like to welcome you to our presentation on dissecting step one. Special welcome here to our crowd and of course all those of you who are tuning in to our webinar. What are we going to talk about today? Well first let's go over the exam. After that we're going to look at the questions. How are they written? Now this is going to serve as the foundation, this theory is going to serve as a foundation for strategies. Strategies in how we study, strategies in how we do our questions. Then we'll have time briefly to go over test day, what to expect, and at the end uh, we'll have time for questions. So, the exam. Know your opponent. I originally considered writing know your enemy, but I didn't want to be so cynical. <laughs> now, we all know that being a good test taker does not necessarily make you a good physician, right? However, US Middle E, step one, is just simply something that we all have to go through. It's a rite of passage. So, what is this exam? What is it all about? Well, let's find out straight from the MBME. And here they say, step one assesses whether you understand and can apply important concepts of the sciences basic to the practice of medicine, with a special emphasis on principles and mechanisms underlying health, disease, and modes of therapy. All right, easy, huh? <laughs> All right, this is obviously a huge uh, description and can cover a wide array of material. And indeed, the content, with the content, the sky is the limit. If you wish, you can go find out all the things I ask about on the content outline. There's 37 pages, we have it listed here. Uh, we at Amboss, we've already done this and with our material. Um, but we don't have time for that right now. I will, however, go over some of the systems here. We can, you can see here all the different systems in place. I think it's self-explanatory. Everything you're going to be studying in medical school. Here are the different processes. All right. Uh, here we have physician tasks and competencies. These are the things they want you to do in the exam. So what are those? Well, you should be able to apply foundational science concepts. This is going to be about half the questions. Some of the questions are going to go into diagnosis. Some are going to be a management. And minority questions are going to focus on communication. And lastly, some practice-based learning and improvement. Now, what about the disciplines? Here you go. Again, these are all the things that you have in medical school. Pathology, physiology, all the way down to genetics. Now, how can we use this towards our advantage, knowing this information? Let me ask you something. If you see that pathology is roughly half of the exam here, and genetics is less than 10%, which topic do you think you should be focusing on first? <laughs> genetics? No, of course not you should be focusing on pathology. Make sure you got your pathology down before you start getting into the details of genetics. So, you may be wondering at this point, okay, how does this all tie into logistics of step one? Let's go over that briefly. What is step one? It's an eight hour computer-based examination session. It's divided into seven 60 minute blocks. You have up to 60 minutes to do that, and there can be about uh, up to 40 questions per block. These are single-based answers, multiple choice, and you have 90 seconds roughly per question. Remember that, because time management is an important part of succeeding on this exam. And we're going to talk about uh, some strategies on that later. That means you have up to 280 MCQs per exam. What else? You do get a break time. 45 minutes, and you have 15 minutes of a tutorial. Now, this is optional. You can just kind of click through, and any time you have left over can be added towards your break. And trust me, you're going to want your breaks, all right? It's a very long exam, a very long day, so make sure you, you use them wisely. What else uh, adds time to your break time? If you happen to have uh, time left over at the end of a block, because you have up to 60 minutes, let's say you have five minutes left over, that's also added to your break time. Okay. 
That's the exam. What about, let's, let's dive a little deeper now. What about the questions? Now, we all know the saying, uh, the only stupid question is the one that is never asked. I didn't feel this way when I was taking my exam. I felt that there were lots of stupid questions, and you may be feeling similarly now, right? And you know which questions I thought were the stupidest ones? The ones I got wrong, of course, right? Nah, but uh, when I first started working at Amboss, um, several years ago, I, I Googled, how do you write an MBME style question? And this meme popped up. I was like, oh cool, look at it, it's all broken down here. Now you obviously, you won't be able to see everything here and I'm not gonna read through it all, but I am gonna uh, uh, go over just a few things. The first thing here was, begin with a simple topic that most medical students should know. Okay, which part of the nephron does thiazide have its effect? Okay, a pretty basic concept. What's next? Now add a clinical correlate. All right. Now add unnecessary detail. Next, now obfuscate anything possible in the question stem. Now add unnecessary big words and numbers. We're getting bigger and bigger. And finally, change the sentence structure and use uncommon units. <laughs> so what are we left with? That basic concept comes down to a living person with a history of CV disease and endocrine disorder who remains a split ethnicity between Pacific Island or Caucasian despite recently passing Jubilee plus a decade in the age, blah, 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 okay. Now, this is obviously a joke, right? How are the questions really made? Well, you can go find out if you want. At Amboss, we've already uh, reviewed all the material that the MBME has provided on how to, how to write the stuff. And one of their most important sources is here, Constructing Written Test Questions for the Basic and Clinical Sciences, also known as a gold book. It's about 100, uh, about 100 pages, so if you're looking for some pleasure reading, uh, go for it. 100 pages. What I'm going to do is pull out some of the most important things, I think, for you that you might be able to uh, apply when you're studying. Um, the, the MBME questions emphasize understanding and application of knowledge. Fact recall, forget it, okay? High school days of these fact recall questions, forget them. They, they, don't, they don't really exist. Yeah, you'll find some of it, but you got a bit lucky, all right? What does that mean? It means you need to really uh, have a good understanding of what you're studying. Um, an example of this might be you're, you're studying a, 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 a drug group, okay? And uh, you have the option, I could, I could memorize every single drug in this group, or I can make sure I know the mechanism of action really well. You better focus on the MOA first, okay? Don't be memorizing every last drug there. MOA, understanding, and then you can go to the drugs. Items reflect real life tasks, okay? What does it mean, okay? You have a lot of clinical vignettes. Patients come in with symptoms, and then you're supposed to do a workup, and then solve something. That's the same thing here. What does that mean? Stems are gonna have so-called window dressing. Now at AMBOSS, we often get this like, oh, your, um, some of your questions have information that isn't relevant to answer the question right. Well, that's what the MBME does too, okay? It says right in it, our items tend to have a mix of important and unimportant findings. So get used to this. Uh, one other condition that the MBME says for a good question is that test takers can answer the question without looking at the options. Now I want you to remember this when we talk later about question strategy. Um, the types of questions, so we, we already talked about understanding. What does that mean? You need to be able to identify the important findings in the STEM. You need to integrate that with your knowledge, and then you're given an assignment. You guess something, a drug, a behavior, a diet, something like that, okay? Or maybe it's asking you predict. Predict uh, what other findings would you expect with this patient? Or maybe you have to really identify uh, what's the diagnosis or the underlying pathology here. So what else can I tell you about the types of questions here? 
There are first order and second order questions. What does that mean? A first order question, it's a straightforward thing. You don't have to uh, uh, read into an intermediate step. Perfect example, what's the diagnosis? What's the second order question? Well, we can take that part. Maybe there is an intermediate step. So let's say uh, you're given an assignment and it's asking something like, okay, patient comes with this and this and this, but they don't give you the diagnosis. Instead, what they're asking you is, uh, what's the underlying pathology of this? Pathophysiology, uh, how do you treat this patient? Uh, how do you treat this patient? And your job is first figure out what the diagnosis is and then answer the question. So get used to those. About 90% of the questions are actually clinical vignettes, the real life tasks. About 10% are going to be experimental vignettes, so something in a lab or whatever. Uh, you have a researcher conducting uh, some type of study, a lab procedure, and uh, here it's tasting, testing your basic science concepts. Tasting. I don't think you want to taste your basic science concepts. Now with the questions, you're going to have roughly three or four questions that have medical imaging or some type of illustrations three or four questions per block. Now, some of these, about, probably about one per block, is going to have labels. The typical, this is, very, is a classic anatomy, right? You're given some type of imaging, and then it points to different structures, and you have to figure out which one's right. You will have probably about one question per block as a graph or a chart. Uh, some, sometimes you're going to have a clinical examination video, so you'll probably get at least one or two of these per exam. A classic. So what, what is this? Literally, it's a video of a patient with some type of behavior. Classic example is a resting tremor. And then they're asking you, okay, what does a patient have? Go, okay, Parkinson's. Right on. Other types of questions include having interactive media. Okay, you have an image. Classic is where you have to uh, have, you have auscultation points. Okay, you mouse over, and you hear the heart sound or heart murmur, and then you have to uh, answer the question using that information. We also have communication ethics videos. These are pretty new, and these are designed to test patient-doctor interactions. So, and you need to be able to um, get a feeling for how is the patient behaving What's your intonation? And using that information, answer the question. OK, so we talked about all these different types of questions. And I've mentioned these, these uh, terms like stems, vignettes. And uh, let's go dive deeper into this. Then. What is exactly a clinical vignette? Well, lucky for you, uh, the MBME always follows a certain structure with their vignettes. And it's going to include some or all of the following. The first part here is presentation, right? You're always going to have uh, age, gender, the side of care physician, and presenting complaint and with this duration. So always look out for that. Another thing that will always, of course, be there is a lead-in. This is your task. And it's going to say which of the following and most likely. We'll talk about most likely here soon. What else can be in there? History. Usually, not always, of a physical examination. You can also expect diagnostic findings sometimes, and potentially some follow-up information. OK. Now, when I was first studying, I would see a wall of text like this. And this is, you know, this is fair game for step one. You don't have too, too many really long ones, but they do exist. And they're getting longer, by the way. But when I first looked at this, I was like, oh my god, how am I going to get through all of this material? I have another 39 questions in this block that look like this. There's so much stuff here. Well, that, I, I, didn't, I wasn't really familiar with how the vignettes were written. And if I was, I would have felt a lot surer when I'm reading through this. Okay? What do I mean by that? Well, we see that uh, this information can be broken down. Now, when I was preparing this presentation, my daughter happened to be in the, the room, and she's really into rainbows and unicorns right now. 
And so she helped me with this next part in which we can indeed take each one of those parts and you can see, okay, the beginning we have the age and the sex. Okay, where do they go? What's happening? Coming to the physician. And the list goes on and on. So if I want to look for something specific, like, okay, I, I need to, f I have a, a, a theory of what the diagnosis could be. Let me just uh, check out the vitals. Then I know, okay, uh, vitals are going to be right here, right before um, the examination findings. Bam, I can go there, check it. I don't have to read through the whole stem. And that will make me faster and a lot more confident when I'm going through these vignettes. What else should you know about the vignettes? Uh, this is just like some uh, little tidbits, and this is based on our own research at AMBOSS. There's nothing out there official that shows it. But we find that there are roughly five sentences for the vignettes in the first step one, but this varies greatly. It could be anywhere from two to 13 sentences. Uh, answer options, uh, 5.3 options is the average. Of course, you're not getting 5.3 literally, but there's this range of four to 10 options. That's what you can expect there. Luckily for you, for step one, there are no matching questions, no sequential sets, no paper abstract questions, and no drug advertisements. That's something you can look forward to in step two. Regarding terminology, uh, when I was going through medical school, there was like this dogma, hey, you should learn buzzwords. So yeah, I definitely learned buzzwords. But the thing is, the MBME, doesn't use a whole lot of buzzwords. If they use buzzwords, you got lucky, really. They describe things. They don't use the buzzwords. What are, what, what are some examples of this? Chemistry Wilson nodules. What do you think when you hear this? What, what's the diagnosis? Diabetes. Diabetes, has diabetic nephropathy, right? Would you know how to describe it? The light microscopy? Ah, be familiar with that, okay? Another example, strawberry tongue. Okay. High yield, absolutely have to know this. Okay, yeah, scarlet fever, what else? Kawasaki, okay, there, there are a couple diagnoses here. That could be helpful, but do you honestly think that the MBME is gonna give you a question that says, the patient has strawberry tongue? No, they're not. Wouldn't it be a shame if you got that question wrong because you didn't actually study the, the medical terminology here, a bright red tongue with popular hyperplasia, and you didn't make that connection. That's, that's what strawberry tongue is. Okay. So be careful. Don't rely only on these. Make sure you know also the, the, the medical descriptions of them. Another thing to be careful of, combo pearls. What is that? Triads, pentads, a classic here. Charcoal triad, what is it? Sorry? Cholangitis. Cholangitis, okay, and what does it exist of? Right, good. Fever, jaundice, abdominal pain. Cholangitis, well, guess how many patients actually have it? This triad, only about half. Another example. Reactive arthritis, very high yields. What's mnemonic? Can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. Okay, conjunctivitis, urethritis, arthritis. But how many patients actually have all three of these symptoms? How many patients with reactive arthritis have all three? About a third. What's the point? Just because you don't see all three of those there in your question doesn't mean that that patient uh, doesn't have reactive arthritis. So be aware of that. Now, we talked a lot about the vignettes. What about the answer choices? There's something that we need to make very clear right now. The, the MBME does not create black, white questions, okay? There's sometimes a bit of a gray zone. What do I mean by that? They use the word most likely. And this is straight from the MME. This is out of their, uh, that book I showed you before. They have here a scale of the answer options, D, C, A, E, and B. You can see on the left side, we have the least correct. They don't say wrong. 
they say least correct. On the right side, we have most correct. Okay? Now, we sometimes get feedback uh, here in AMBOSS with our questions. Hey, under certain situations, you know, if there's lightning and in a storm and a, um, whatever, that this patient could, that, you know, this answer option could be right. Like, yeah, we recognize it. True, right? But we are focused on mocking the real exam, and we're focusing on what's most correct. Okay? You can't, the, the question writer's always right. There's no point in trying to argue with them here. You're either right or you're wrong when you mark that, that answer option, okay? So don't um, get stressed out about this. Don't make it a big deal. Just accept it. <laughs> and uh, make sure you're focusing on most correct, and that's it. What else should we consider with our answer choices? Well, there are certain things that the MME has picked up on called technical item flaw flaws and test-wise strategies. Some of you may be awesome test takers. You're very test-wise is the word. In other words, you figured out some tricks to get the answer right without even having to know the content or the objective. What am I talking about here? Well, there are several things, but I wanted to just highlight a few here that you should be careful with. One is the longest answer choice is correct. Nope, that's not true for MBME questions. If you rely on this in any way, shape, or form, forget it right now. What else? Convergent strategy. What is this? Well, you have, here's an example, a brown bird, a brown dog, and a gray dog. We have two browns. We have two dogs. So where the, all these terms overlap the most, where they converge, a, a brown dog. So a brown dog must be right, yeah? Well, you know what? There are a lot of uh, exams out there that do this. And this would be a very advantageous strategy. You don't even have to study. Cool. The MME, they're very aware of it. So don't try it with them. In fact, it can even come back to nip you in the butt. And I'll show you an example of that later. Paired options. What is this? This is the thinking, well, if A is right, um, then B must also be right because they're related, right? Uh, therefore, A and B must both, both be correct so I can uh, get rid of them both. The MME doesn't do this. Okay, they're not going to give you these little tricks where two options are so related that you can eliminate both of them because, yeah, because of this strategy. So now we're going to go on to um, your, your strategy for studying for this exam. Okay, now that we've gone over how the exam is and the questions, and I had to think back on my days in college many, many years ago, <laughs> in which, uh, uh, during this time, I was really into rock climbing. And I wanted to get good at it. And so I was you know, climbing, I was doing bouldering, I was going to the weight room, get my strength up, I had my pull-up routine down, my finger uh, strength routine, I was running, I was doing all types of stuff so that I was going to be a better climber. And I was getting better, but not to the extent that I wanted to. My friends were getting even better than me, blah, blah, blah. So I picked up this book, and uh, it's called How to Climb 512. 512 is just an advanced route, okay, by Eric Horst. And in it, <laughs> it's real basic, it's a no-brainer, but he says, the best way to train for climbing is climbing. I was overthinking, I was overcomplicating everything. I should have just been climbing more. And it was like an epiphany for me, even though it's, so simple. <laughs> and I realized I can, uh, I've actually applied this throughout many other things in my life since then. And for step one, the best way to train for step one questions, what do you think, is by doing? Exactly. Doing step one questions. And doing especially unique questions. All right. 
It, studies have shown the more questions you do, the higher you score. It's as simple as that. What does this mean? How, what, like, what else can we be doing to do well on step one other than questions? And this is kind of interrelated. We should be starting early. Okay? You can never start too early with your questions. That's what I say. Why is that? Why are questions so important? What do you think? To apply the knowledge. Right. It forces you to apply your knowledge. You can read through books, right? You read through a whole chapter. I don't know about you, but I've forgotten 99% of it by the time I get to the end. With questions, that's not the case. I'm using that information, so I'm going to remember it a lot longer. It also exposes my weaknesses. When do we learn best? When we get things right or when we get things wrong? Exactly. So don't be afraid to start questions early and to do a lot of them and to even get lots of stuff wrong because it's in those situations that you're going to learn best. What else do you think is important for uh, uh, doing well on step one? You should review high yield content. Studies have also shown that this is important. Now, how should we review this high yield content? I think that's an important question to ask. Should we start at the beginning of the book and read all, all, all the way through? You should be reviewing the high yield stuff. Once you have a real basic foundation and understanding, go to your questions. And then you identify your weaknesses, your gaps. And after that, you can review the high yield stuff. Okay? Don't just read from A to Z. The last thing that I like to point out that's important for scoring well is aiming high. Uh, how is the saying from um, uh, shoot for the moon, if you miss, you'll land among the stars. And that's really the same thing here. If you feel happy, if you would be happy with a 240, you're like, oh yeah, that'd be good. I always say aim 10 points higher, aim for a 250. If you score a 240, you're still going to be happy. But it's that extra little effort that you put in that's going to help you guarantee that. So what else should you keep in mind while you're studying? Quality over quantity. What does that mean? You should be focusing on the how, the why, and not the what. Okay, We talked earlier about you know, uh, if you have a drug group, study, learn the mechanism of action. Don't try to memorize every drug. You should be actively making connections when you're studying. You have these mechanisms. You know that uh, there are two interrelated items. Quickly review that in your head. If you find that there's a loose end in your understanding, fill it in. Absolutely. That's so much more important than trying to memorize another fact. When you're going through, you should also make sure you're focusing on unique and differentiating info. Something that's very specific to a disease or uh, to, uh, you know, the most common a complication of a treatment. At Amboss, we've actually uh, created a tool that helps out with this ca uh, called the highlight tool that does exactly that. It highlights the key terms inside of a stem that's going to help differentiate the right from the incorrect answer option. And you should be doing the same while, when you're uh, highlighting stuff. So what else? You need to be studying your weaknesses, okay? I think that's a no-brainer. But you'd be surprised how many people do what I call feel-good studying, okay? What does that mean? You're studying stuff that you already know, and you're getting it right, one right after the next. You're like, oh yeah, I'm on a roll. I'm ready for this exam, right? Don't fool yourself. I, you can indulge a little. That's okay. <laughs> but. Your main emphasis should be on your weaknesses. You should also be specific. If you are not, let's say, um, one of your areas of weaknesses is antidepressants. Would you study all of psychiatry? No. Go to, straight to antidepressants and move on to the next specific topic. There are a lot of resources out there that are like, hey, you know, you're not good in this system. 
or this system, or this topic. And it's like, well, yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Uh, but I need to be more specific. Um, with MOS, we actually have a, a, a recommendation that breaks it down by individual topics as well. And you should be doing the same with your study habits. One other piece of advice I received, and this was probably one of the best pieces of advice when I was studying. Study things as if it's the last time you will. You'd be surprised how big of an impact this can have on how well you retain information. The thing is, there's a good chance that will be the last time you see it before your exam date. So remember that. Good. Now, on to question strategies. This is what probably all of you have come for. What are the tricks? And what are the magic bullets that are going to get me uh, several questions right without me even having to study? Well, I have some bad news for you. There are no tricks. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. There's a hard truth with this exam, and that is you have to practice. Practice, practice, practice. With that said, perhaps we can come up with some strategies. And these can help guide you then when you're going through the questions. So let's review those now. What does the MBME say? Well, this is straight from their. Um, one of the descriptions on the website, and they say, first, read each question carefully. It is important to understand what is being asked. OK. <laughs> Try to generate an answer, and then, then look for it in the option list. All right. <laughs> read each option carefully, sorry, limiting those that are clearly incorrect. After that, of the remaining options, select the one that is most correct. OK? <laughs> and lastly, if you're unsure, guess because unanswered questions are automatically wrong. OK, some of this, a lot of this is a no-brainer. Right? <laughs> it's just part of the process of doing questions. This last one is definitely true, though. Remember, you, will, you, uh, you can answer a question wrong, and you don't get any points uh, deducted. So make sure you indeed are answering every single question by the end of it. What else could we think of, though? Maybe some other helpful tip, uh, tips here. Well, what is this? Is this a bald eagle? <laughs> is this a penguin? No. Is it a pterodactyl? No. no, it's a duck. Remember this, the duck test. If it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. The MBME is not trying to trick you. This is a very fair exam. Don't assume that they're trying to trick you. OK, I mentioned earlier we have 90 seconds per question. You need to manage your time. You need to be efficient. Not only does this help save you time, so you have more time to answer uh, uh, questions towards the end, or make sure you get through all the questions, but when you have more time, you're less nervous. You're less nervous, you're less likely to screw up, and you're going to score better. When you're going through this, when you feel that you have, when you're going through a question, when you feel like you have enough information, answer it and move on. Don't sit there and try to reconfirm over and over again that you chose the right answer. You don't have time for that. Really. Mark and go. Next, do not always read all lab values. We saw that example before. You know, there were like 10 lab values. Well, maybe only one is really relevant. Find the one, be like, OK, that's all I need to know, and ignore the rest. Sometimes you have to read all lab values. Maybe they're just three points. That's part of the package. But don't do more than you have to. Highlight sparingly. When I first started studying, I was going through and highlighting, and my entire vignettes were yellow. I don't know if this has happened to you, but it was for me. And I had to learn to be more specific with my highlighting. Just as I said before, we should be focusing on what's unique and differentiates. That's what the highlight tool should be used for. Remember that all questions are only worth one point. 
You get a hard question, it's going to take a lot of time. Don't be a hero. <laughs> Don't try to solve that question, especially if it's at the beginning of your block. You take five minutes to try to answer a hard question. That's three and a half minutes lost for other questions. That's 2.33 easy questions that you could have potentially got right. But if you're spending all your time on the hard questions in the beginning, you get towards the end of your block, you're out of time, you've gotten maybe two to three questions wrong that you could have definitely gotten right. So be careful with that. Don't be a hero. With that said, you also cannot expect an epiphany. Okay, I was going through my exam and I was like, oh, I know, I know, that. there were like several questions. It's like, ah, I know, I know this. I've definitely seen this before. I studied this. I knew this two days ago. And I was like, I, I, I think I can get it. I think I can get it. I think I can get it. Nope. <laughs> you have 280 questions. You got to blast through these things. You're nervous. You're probably tired. Like, don't sit there and dwell on these. Don't beat yourself up either if you do forget them because everyone is forgetting stuff. We're all in the same boat here with this exam. Just accept it. Think about the other 90% of the material that you definitely did know and be reassured and move on. Lastly, if you're unsure about an answer option and you're seeing, uh, okay, this option looks most relevant for what I think it is, but I, I don't know, mark that, okay? Because there's a good chance you're finding it familiar for a reason. <laughs> Mark that one and move on. This is basically an educated guess, okay? So, these are, those are the general tips. Now let's get into some approaches for questions. So we have this long uh, uh, questionnaire and there are different ways you can approach a vignette. One of them is indeed to read the whole question from top to bottom. What are the advantages of this? You develop a full picture, right? You're less likely to miss information. And uh, you have a consistent time expenditure. So you always know what to expect here. With that said, there are some disadvantages. It will take longer to read through every single STEM. Two, 280 questions, you're reading everything. It's a lot of reading. It's going to be hard to concentrate after four or five hours of that. Next, extraneous information uh, may actually confuse you, this, this window dressing stuff. So, and uh, as I said before, this, this is going to require a lot more information. When might you do this approach? Well, I would suggest taking this approach for shorter questions. There are only three or four sentences, so does it make sense to try to somehow reverse engineer it and pick it apart backwards? Probably not. Just start from the beginning and work your way through. Uh, you could also do this if you have, find yourself with a lot of leftover time. Why not? So who would this be beneficial for? Yeah, fast readers. Uh, those uh, who may be anxious by skipping over information as well. So I'm mentioning all of these uh, uh, different approaches and tips. The reality is, at the end of the day, there is not going to be a one-size-fits-all approach. Not for one single person and not for one single question. You actually need to experiment and figure out what works best for you. And if you're unsure, you've got you know, thousands of practice questions to go through. Experiment during this time. Do some trial and error. If you get through one block, and you're like, okay, uh, I'm finishing with five minutes. That worked pretty well. And another block, you tried a different approach, and you didn't even, you still have five questions you have to do, then obviously that second approach isn't going to work for you. Okay? Now, I talked about this first approach, reading through all the questions, and I would like to try to use this now with some sample questions. Now, these sample questions are straight from the MBME. They're publicly available. You can go find them yourself if you want. We have a link provided here. And uh, this first one, we find here a relatively short stem. 
It's only two sentences and the lead-in. So I'm thinking, why not just read the whole thing? Let's do that. So we have a 23-year-old woman with bone marrow failure is treated with a large dose of rabbit antithymocyte globulin. 10 days later, she develops fever, lymphadenopathy, arthralgias, and erythema on her hands and feet. Which of the following is the most likely cause of these symptoms? So there we have a very condensed uh, uh, presentation of all the findings we should know, the diagnostic stuff, uh, um, uh, the clinical examination. What do you think? C, immune complex deposition in tissues. What does a patient have? Yeah, serum sickness syndrome. Okay. So we get protein. Ten days later, she has this um, hypersensitivity type 3 reaction because of immune complex buildup. Okay. Good. So that approach works there. What's another approach? Well, we can also read the lead-in first. And this is honestly my personal favorite. <laughs> Why? Because this helps guide my approach for what I should actually do next. Next, uh, sometimes the lead-in is all you need. You don't even have to read the vignette. It doesn't happen too often uh, for step one. Every once in a while you get lucky. And uh, another thing is that this helps save you time. Let's say you're a slow reader like, like I am. And um, if I can save some time for other questions where I indeed have to read everything, that would be great. So let's try this out. Here we have a question that says, the increased myelinyl-CoA concentration most likely directly inhibits which of the following processes in, this, in, in these subjects? That's the lead-in. Do we even need to read the rest of the stem to get this right? No. no. The concept is right here. Right? And what's the answer going to be? Mono-CoA inhibits what? Fatty acid. Fatty acid oxidation. Feel free to speak up. It's, it's OK. <laughs> We're, we won't bite here. <laughs> OK, yeah, fatty acid oxidation. What happens here? What's the mechanism? Why? We, we want to get it right for the right reasons, OK? So let's understand why, how. What happens here? Right, uh, so inhibits carnitine acetyltransferase 1. Fatty acids can't go into mitochondria. No fatty acid breakdown. OK. Um, another approach is read one or two sentences before the lead-in. All right, so you read the lead-in, and then what do you do? Start at the beginning? Nah, not necessarily. Why don't you go one or two before? Why? Often, you'll get the diagnosis or a treatment right there. And then it's asking you a lead up, a lead in directly related to that. So the rest of the information, you don't even need to know. Sometimes, you have confirmatory diagnostic findings. Isn't that great? Like, it's right, it confirms the diagnosis? Well, wow, the rest of the information doesn't even matter. All right, here are the advantages. Of course, this is all you need to know, so it will save time, helps guide your approach again. Disadvantages, you may lose some time having to reread the stem. Okay, so you reread it, you read it, and you're like, oh, that wasn't enough context. I need to start at the beginning in, after all. Okay, but I think it's a, a risk worth taking, and I'm going to show you why here. When would this be especially beneficial? To, for long questions, especially. And for who? Slow readers, those struggling to finish their blocks, getting towards the block, they're like, oh, I only got one minute, one question. Okay and overthinkers. So this is, again, one of my top candidates because I fulfill all these criteria here. <laughs> Let's see how this works then in action. So another question, practice question. Let's read the lead in first. Which of the following serum findings is most likely to occur in this patient? OK. Let's go one question, uh, one sentence before. Treatment with atorvastatin and losartan is initiated. Do we have to read the rest of the stem to be able to answer this question? No. no. Okay. Did you have a question? No. 
Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. All right. So uh, statins. What do they do? HDL. They increase. Triglycerides. Decrease. C. Easy. Well, how long did it take us? Did we need 90 seconds for that? No. What? 15, 20 seconds? I got 70 seconds for the hard questions, so I can go be a hero, right? <laughs> Another example. Deposition of which of the following substances is the most likely cause of these findings? OK, let's go one sentence before. Uh, examination of synovial fluid obtained via joint aspiration shows that it is clear with positively bifringent rhomboids observed under the polarized light microscopy. What's the answer? C. Calcium pyrophosphate. What's the patient have? Pseudogout. Yeah, pseudogout. Another example. Which of the following best describes the pathogenesis of this patient's disease? Let's go out of the sentence before. Examination of biopsy specimens from the cervix and anterior wall of the vagina show well-differentiated keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. Got cervical cancer. What do you think? Cervical cancer. What's, what causes cervical cancer? HPV. What does HPV do? What? HPV, we have 16, 18, high risk. They have the E6, E7, and one of them inactivates cellular P53. What else? Retinoblastoma. OK. These are both tumor. What kind of genes? Tumor? Suppressor. Tumor suppressor genes. Good. All right. But uh, we had to think through that a little bit. We didn't have to read the, We had time, though, to think through it, right? Because I didn't have to read the rest of the stem. Here's another example. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Let's go back. Uh, let's start here. Peripheral blood smear shows 3 plus polychromasia and 3 plus schistocytes. Wait a second. Schistocytes? There are only certain conditions associated with that, right? So, what do you think is going to be the most likely diagnosis? TTP. C. Okay. What's the mechanism here? It's a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. What happens? Clots, red blood cells do what against the clots? Bam, hit those clots, fragment, schistocytes. Now, let's say you wanted to confirm this. What would you do? We know where the information is in the stem, don't we? Because we already reviewed where those different parts are. So you're going to go straight to the labs, look at platelet count, 15,000. Is that a lot or a little? Yeah, it's not much. Mark, move on. Bam, done. Didn't take long. Look at that. That's a long stem. How much time? Uh, if we were to read through all of that and try to then answer the question, it would, it would take me a lot more than 90 seconds. OK. So what's another approach? Well, we can also, sometimes we may have to read options before the stem. When might this be helpful? It provides context if the lead-in is unclear. It can also provide context if a stem is long or confusing in some way, shape, or form. What are the disadvantages? Uh, you lose time ruling things out. Remember what I said before? The MME says a good question you should be able to answer without looking at the options. And we, what, what did we say? We should try to get questions right for the right reasons. So try, really try to avoid ruling things out unless you really have to. Uh, it may also complicate things. You may overthink, right? Because one question ended up becoming basically five. So you're like trying to rule them all out. It also promotes second guessing yourself. When was it, would this be appropriate? We already mentioned for confusing stems or if the lead in context is unclear. 
And uh, here's an example then of that. Which of the following sets of laboratory values is, a, is most likely in this, in this patient's serum? Okay, lab findings. That's a pretty broad thing. I don't know where this is going. Could, could be anything, right? So let's briefly check it out. Okay, we have TSH, thyroxin, free thyroxin, TBG. Okay, now what are we thinking? What kind of condition is this patient going to have? A... A thyroid condition, and I already heard it. <laughs> uh, let's go out and uh, read briefly the sentence before. Okay, uh, we'll start with the physical examination. Shows fine, thin hair, goiter, warm. Okay, uh, we're seeing tachycardia, widened pulse pressure. What are we thinking? Hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism. And a uh, 42-year-old woman, uh, goiter, what are we thinking? Most likely cause? Graves. Graves. So what would we expect in Graves' disease? What is TSH going to be? Down. Down? And T4? High. High. Done. That's it. Right? We don't have to read the rest. Move on. Which of the following is the most likely outcome of this patient's infection? OK, again, a pretty broad term. And Rather than having to read through the whole stem to try to figure out where is this going, I, have, I don't know what, 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 what's actually expected of me here. Let's look at the options briefly. So we have complete resolution, latent infection, lifelong persistence. OK, so we're kind of talking about prognosis. Now we have our context. So we have to figure out what the condition is. Let's go back one sentence before. In this case, there is no sentence. We can go straight to lab values. What do we see here? Serology. Ooh, serology, they're great questions because serology is almost always going to give you confirmatory finding. Okay, negative, negative, negative. Oh, positive, positive, positive. What's positive at the end? Anti-hepatitis C virus is positive. Hepatitis C RNA is also positive. What happens in up to 85% of patients with HCV? C, lifelong persistent infection. All the answers are C. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> that just was by chance. <laughs> OK, another approach. Cross out unlikely options if you don't know the answer. This is really the last technique I would recommend. It's pretty much something like a, a last resort, OK? So of course, it helps the process of elimination, increases your chances of getting it correct. If you turn. Uh, one out of five down to 50-50. Those are decent chances then. Disadvantages takes, of course, time, as we discussed before. And you may do this uh, second guessing, building anxiety. When should you do it when you really just don't know the answer? OK, here's an example of that. Which of the following best describes this study design? OK, I obviously have to read the whole stem here. All right, it's a short stem anyway. So let's go through it. Studies designed to evaluate the feasibility of acupuncture in children with chronic headaches. 60 children with chronic headaches are recruited for the study. In addition to their usual therapy, all children are treated with acupuncture three times a week for two months. Oh, epidemiology. One of my, one of my weak points. OK. I don't know the answer. But let's start ruling some stuff out. Let's see. Randomized clinical trial, no. Nah. Definitely not that. Historical cohort, no. Cross-sectional, also not. Is it case control? No. So I'm thinking, ah, maybe it's crossover or case series, you know, because those are the only two I'm unsure about at this point. I'm going to mark the first one and move on. I may flag it because I was completely didn't know it all. But to be honest, am I going to have an epiphany? No. OK? So. I would be very conservative on what you decide to flag and come back to. We'll talk about that in a second. I'm, getting, I'm jumping ahead. Uh, indeed, here, uh, B would be the right answer. OK. Reviewing items. I would only, so you get, you get through all of your questions in a block. You have five minutes left over. You can go take a break. You can go review stuff. Be careful if you're reviewing. You may start second guessing. Um, I would only recommend this if you have extra time, first of all. And only for stuff that you're absolutely unsure about. 
And as I said before, flag only these. If you made, if you made an educated guess, don't flag that. It's important to trust yourself and your initial instincts in this exam. It's really important. And remember that everyone is going to be getting some stuff wrong. Now, if this is something completely new, a topic that you've never seen before, then you might, and you have the time, and sure, you can spend a little time on it, but don't drive yourself crazy. Don't forget you need to take a break, too. Good. So now that we've gone over how we can study, how we can do our questions, we're prepared. We did thousands of practice questions. And we review content in our high yield books, all of our weaknesses. It's test day. Don't freak out. <laughs> uh, remember that nobody is perfect. You're, you're noticing a trend here, right? You will not get all the questions right. No one gets all the questions right. Even the highest scorers still get a decent chunk of questions wrong. Expect things you've never seen before. This is just the way it is. This is how the MBME tests out new questions. They, they'll put in um, uh, new topics, and uh, they'll have it in the pool of uh, sample questions for a year before they actually may include it, or maybe they'll even throw it out. So don't get too worked up about stuff you haven't seen. You can't prepare for everything, and the thing is, this is going to feel a lot more common than it really is. Yeah, when I was going through my questions, uh, when, I, when, I, when I took step one, I was thinking, I, I really focused on this, uh, these few questions, like, OK, I got this one, I got this one. Oh, no, this one I don't know. What happened? And I thought I studied so well. What happened? And then I thought back on it later, and it's like, maybe a, a handful of questions per block. You have 40 questions. And you're talking like maybe 10% of the questions where I'm not so sure about. But I was so focused on that 10%. I got so nervous and worked up about those. Forget it. Take the 90% and be happy. Remember that everyone is in the same boat as you and that this is also scored according to a curve. Good. What else should you do on test day? OK. You're probably wondering, what is this? <laughs> During this part of the presentation, my son came into the room <laughs> with my daughter. So of course, she wanted uh, um, rainbow colors and unicorns again. And my son, he's four. He's into dinosaurs. And he's like, uh, he's like dinosaurs, T-Rex. So we had to put a T-Rex in here. And what I really liked is uh, this image, I think, portrays what you should be like the day before your exam. Relaxed, happy. I mean, this is a huge milestone in your life. Everything you did, all this, how many thousands of questions, be happy for that. Be proud, excited. Go get an ice cream. Go hang out in the, next to volcanoes if you want. No. Um, <laughs> take care of yourself, OK? Don't forget to eat, to sleep, uh, um, to go to the bathroom. No. Uh, <laughs> don't do any last minute studying. There's not much you're going to pick up on in that last day. Okay, what did I say? This is not a fact recall exam. This is an understanding exam. And understanding takes time and practice that you can't do in just one day. Trust your training. Really, trust yourselves. You're going to do awesome. Be confident. Be proud. Um, you've got this. This is not going to happen to you on exam day. All of your practice is going to pay off. And instead, this is what you're going to expect. There will be no hurdles for you, and you're going to get right up that wall. OK, thank you very much for listening. Uh, here are the references if you want to uh, find out where we got some of the information. Disclaimer here, MBME, we have some of their content here. And are there any questions on, about questions? So I can raise this. Also from the webinar, um, please uh, feel free to uh, put in the chat any questions you have at this time. We're happy to take them and answer what we can.
uh, I, I don't know if it's a good question. I, um, I feel like you answered most of it, but um, and I guess it could be done through repetition for myself. But I'm, what do you think about the strategy of like just if you see a question you don't know, just dropping it and then moving on and then at the end coming back? Is that a bad idea or is that just from person to person? Uh, there are two approaches I would consider. You have to think you've already invested time into that question just by getting to that point to realizing, I don't know the answer. This could be 30 seconds, it could be even a minute. And when you get to the end of the block, if you don't have much time left over, that's, that one minute is pretty much wasted. So here's what I would recommend. Um, if you can make an educated guess, you're pretty sure about something, mark it, move on, and don't even flag. If you really don't know, you're just straight up guessing, you can mark, but still click an answer option. And if you have time, come back, but don't stress out about it, okay? Remember, everyone gets some questions wrong. And it's very likely that you're not gonna have an epiphany between the point you saw that question and the end of your block. Um, would you recommend that individuals start with some of those advanced strategies about reading just the lead-in or reading the one or two sentences before, or should they take some time to do some questions and understand the content that's presented in its entirety before they try to implement those strategies? That's an excellent question. I think it depends on a few factors. First of all, how experienced are you already with practice questions? If you are inexperienced, you're just starting off, and you have a lot of content to still learn, you're getting a lot of questions wrong, it probably makes sense to uh, slow down, take your time going through these questions, and really learn all of the concepts involved here. And to as you get closer to your exam date, during dedicated, you know, you should be doing, I'm often asked, like, how many questions should you be doing um, and I say, start slow, even if one question a day is better than nothing, but then towards dedicated, you should be doing probably two to three blocks, you know, a block being 40 questions um, by the time you get to your exam date. And uh, for these, during this time, indeed, I would start to practice these approaches. At least be very comfortable and familiar with them. And when you, especially when you're like doing timed, randomized, blocks, which you all should be doing, by the way. Uh, you can start off with like set blocks and take your time, but I always say the, the like, minimum of the last thousand questions before your exam should be timed random, just like in exam mode. So yeah, that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Can I ask a, a follow-up question to that? Um, so AMBOSS has a study mode to do questions, and we also have this exam mask. Um, when, when would you recommend starting to only study in using this exam style studying? And when would you use sort of like tools from any study platform that you're using? And how long, when do you start to switch from really diving deeply into a question to learn to just doing these kind of repetitive question sets that you just recommended? Yeah. Uh, another tough question to answer because it depends on so many variables and kind of like how individuals like to learn. I will say I believe in the beginning it's, it does make, when you're getting a lot of questions wrong, you're still learning lots of concepts. Take your time, use study mode, right? Uh, uh, Amboss has, for example, like the attending tip, which explains exactly what I was saying here, the how and the why. And so that helps you, you really nail down uh, learning how to do these uh, intermediate steps, connecting concepts. But again, uh, definitely in dedicated, uh, timed randomized should be, I would say, the majority of the questions that you're doing. Yeah. Um, if, let me put it this way, too. If you're getting through, like, if you're unable to get through timed randomized blocks comfortably, uh, you need to be doing more of those. Okay. Uh, you definitely need to make sure that you have that down. And so test that you could start to um, put your feet in the water definitely towards the beginning of dedicated at the latest. See how you feel, how comfortable you are with time, randomize, and uh, adapt accordingly to however you're doing there. Mm -hmm. 
When you say randomized, yeah. like how random? Because, you know, we talked about, you, you use this example for antidepressants and yeah. all of psychi psychiatry, right? Yeah. Um, do you want to do randomized stuff of the stuff you got wrong or randomized everything? And how do you focus those? Yeah. Uh, I, w I always suggest in the beginning, when you're actually building up your foundation of knowledge, stick with questions on the stuff that you're, you've been studying. Right? You don't, you don't want to be doing questions on stuff you have completely no idea about. Um, yeah, you should be doing as many questions as possible. We learn really well. But if you're getting literally every question wrong, you're guessing a lot, then you probably have to yeah, scale it back a bit and um, review some of that high yield con uh, concepts and then throw in some questions there. Now, you'll get a feeling for this also when you're studying. You'll be like, OK, I feel pretty good about most of the content maybe in this area. And then you can. Uh, once that happens, you can throw, you can like, there are two approaches. You could just do completely straight up cold turkey randomize, or you can kind of slip in uh, systems as you feel more comfortable with them. And uh, this is actually the approach that I took, where I was like, okay, I'm going to start with cardiology and then nephrology, and I'll do a mix here and then throw in gastro and do a mix there until I got to a point where at least like the last thousand questions, they were completely random. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would definitely say the last thousand um, at a minimum. OK. Any other questions? Um, I'm sure you heard this when you were preparing as well. And you even mentioned it, like practice questions, practice more questions. But there's this uh, general opinion amongst test aspirants that we should be doing two, three passes of the same question bank. What do you think about that? Does that make any sense at all? Yeah. Uh, does it doesn't make sense to go through uh, a question bank several times or more than once. Studies have shown, regardless of whether it's repeat questions or new questions, the more questions you do, the higher you're going to score. However, there is a slight trend. The more unique questions you do, in other words, questions you've never seen before, you're, going to, there's, you're more likely to do even better. In fact, uh, there was even one study that showed repeats of a question bank had no um, correlation with the higher score. So, my recommendation is to do as many new questions as possible. With that said, what did we say here? You should be focusing on your weaknesses. This requires reviewing stuff, requires, you know, with a, uh, especially with like space repetition. So there's a mix of uh, things you can do here. Um, something I, I didn't mention, which I can now uh, go into, is that when you're getting questions wrong, I always suggest making sure you're recording the stuff that you didn't know. Why did you get that question wrong? Understand that. You can take a, I did it with a notebook back in the day. <laughs> now everyone's using Anki for the most part. So you can create your Anki stuff and uh, make sure you're reviewing the concepts quickly with that space repetition. Uh, with that said, you can then at some point indeed review questions you got wrong, like the MBME style question. Um, but I wouldn't make this the one focus. If you still have unique questions, new unique questions you could do, uh, make sure you're getting through those for sure. OK. Any other questions? All right. Also, in the audience at home, uh, continue to uh, send us your questions in chat. We'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you also for the participation. I hope that you found this helpful. And I wish you all good luck. I know you're going to do great on your test day.